right, so this is the final part of our program. I'd like for all of you to give yourselves a hand for staying with us throughout the day. Yeah, so at this point, we are going to have a conversation between Professor Margaret Burnham and Chancellor Melissa, Melissa Nobles, and this is being facilitated by our Professor Patricia Williams. In terms of how this whole process started and what the hopes are for the future of the archives. Thank you very much. I am so delighted and honored to be on this stage because I did not expect to. I was asked to do this about five minutes ago, which is where I'm, why I'm wearing my gym outfit, so I apologize. And the idea that I will be archived for purposes of this, in this state is a little daunting. But let me go back to why I'm so honored. Um, this is such an enormous contribution. Um, to history, to the archive, to how Rose described it, to living in history. And uh, I am just here to be the prompt to have you tell us exactly how this came about. What was the genesis of this? The genesis of this. Where did this idea begin? So uh, <clears throat> we started, as I said earlier, thanks so much, uh, Professor Williams, for joining us in your gym clothes. They're, they're lovely, by the way. <laughs> this is, this is, this is why how, she's a great woman. <laughs> this is kind of how we roll. You know, we take advantage of opportunities. <laughs> uh, Professor Williams in the room was really an opportunity, so we dragged her up to the stage. <laughs> so happy to have her. Um, so we started, uh, as I said, at the very uh, beginning of the day uh, in this room in uh, 2007, really examining uh, rights cases from the 1960s and 1970s with a view to participating in some uh, positive and um, uh, robust way in a federal program that was getting off the ground to re-examine these cases and perhaps prosecute them. And we quickly realized, which we should have uh, realized uh, <laughs> earlier, um, that the federal government was not going to fly this flag very high. And that's a long story that Hank and many others in this room um, can tell us about. Uh, but we also realized that there were these, uh, this period of, of history uh, uh, that had gone uh, untouched uh, and that the families uh, whose relatives you heard uh, moments ago uh, deserved an accounting, they deserved to be uh, heard, and perhaps most importantly, that the documents that told part of their stories deserve to be returned to them. And so th we started in a fairly haphazard fashion here at Northeastern, uh, at our law school, just collecting newspaper articles and seeing what we could make of them. And then Nobles came along and she said, you people don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you, you do not know what you're doing. And so she, and she straightened us out, and I'll let her tell that part of the story. So I came to it in a slightly different way. I did participate in the, the conference, but I came as a political scientist, and my, the genesis for me actually was looking at a study, I, was, I studied comparative politics, and I'd given a paper at the University of Virginia, and it was about democratization efforts around the world, and coming out of dictatorship and authoritarian regimes, and what to do with, with the victims and the perpetrators upon the uh, advancement of democratization. Of course, that's been well studied around the world, uh, Europe, South Africa, Latin American dictatorships. But um, what I thought and, uh, was that the US, uh, the South would rightly be considered an authoritarian regime, at least as far as black rights were concerned. And so the civil rights movement could rightly be described as a democratization movement. And if that's the case, then how does one think about rectifying that? Nearly all of the pro pro processes around the world that look at democratization, there are two things that typically happen. A uh, is called the torture problem. What do we do for those who did the problems? Do they, uh, amnesty or punishment? And then what do we do about for victims? In most cases, there's some accounting of the victims, which requires data. 
nearly all of these countries have truth commissions, which are intended to provide that information. As you all know, we've had little of that in the U.S., right? There's been small uh, accounts, but it's been uh, uh, the HR, well, there's so many HR um, bills that sit in the House that have not been passed to deal with just this issue. So, but I thought, well, as a scholar, we could see, well, what, did, what, did, what, what was the nature of those killings, the nature of death during the Jim Crow period? But of course, the conference that Margaret described was largely about the Civil Rights Movement. So you would think if there was going to be counting of violence in the, in, in the South, the Civil Rights Movement would be a logical place to start since by that moment, everyone was paying attention to what was happening in the South. The scholarship on this has been quite, quite sparse in regards to death. There's a lot about the movement itself and about major cases that we all know about and which were important sparks of the movement and certain metrics and milestones, but we don't have a lot about the ordinary violence, never mind the period before the Civil Rights Movement, which is the period that we study. Now, there's one period from the end of the Reconstruction to about 1930 where scholars have looked at it, and there's many books, one famous one that we, that kind of set a certain sociological, uh, created a data set that was about the, the uh, uh, a festival of lynching was published in 1995, and it looks at lynchings, but it stops at 1930. And the authors make the argument, well, lynchings decline after 1930 because blacks migrate out of the South, and, and uh, eventually the, I'm simplifying it, and eventually the mechanization of cotton, we don't need the labor anymore, and so lynching stops. But it's an assertion. It's an assertion because there's no evidence. They haven't collected any data after 1930. So when, uh, when Margaret and I were talking, and she was talking about the, you know, the, what was going on with the uh, cold cases and, and the difficulty of even figuring out the, the nature of death in the 1960s, right, the birth of the Civil Rights Movement in the late 1950s, there was even less in the period prior. And so the motivation was, well, let's see if we can do this database. And we started with newspapers, because that's typically what most scholars use as the kind of the beginnings of the record. So the, the intellectual underpinnings, in addition to Margaret's discussion, as you all have been studying about the limits of law, the other part was, as a scholar, all of us, you need data. And it, you know, we can talk about it, but unless we, and, and as we found out, there's a lot of it. And the data isn't only in papers, it's in families. So we tried to get it, and that's kind of how it was born. And, and I'd love to hear more about specifically the family data. I mean, I am so struck by the fact that I have, I mean, I think probably Margaret asked me because I have this archive of family data that was located in my house because my family was lucky enough to have a house that was in the family for over 100 years. That's really rare among African Americans. The kinds of letters, the kinds of literacy that that requires, the general status of losing property and not having specific homes to live in, the weight of carrying that kind of interior domestic history from, from, from one place to another is such a challenge. So I'm particularly interested, not just in the police records, but how much of this is located in these letters or troves for any well, African American think, family. Well, well, as we traveled and as our students traveled, uh, families have, certainly they have, they carry their oral memories of, of these events. Uh, but we were often presented with, uh, the, all the photographs in the article came, in the, excuse me, in the uh, archive come from families. Um, so, you know, we, uh, some are newspapers, mostly from families. Uh, so we would reach out to, uh, to family members and uh, get whatever, you know, uh, uh, yellow newspaper articles they, that remained in old books that they had kept about these events. I remember, uh, Melissa and I went down to Mississippi to investigate the, uh, the uh, death of a, a young man, 19-year-old young man, uh, who was uh, uh, killed um, in, because wrong place, wrong time, killing. Um, and uh, his um, uh, nephew is, was a justice on the uh, Mississippi Supreme Court and knew very, very, and the family was in the um, funeral business and uh, prominent, in a prominent town in, in Mississippi, prominent funeral uh, uh, home operators. And we went to their home and um, they were all gathered there together and they knew very little about what the official records had show, showed, uh, but they were really um, eager to share with us, you know, their vernacular memories 
Uh, and you remember, you remember they had a, a, a photograph of the, of the guy. They had newspaper clippings from the uh, from the time itself, which was in the 1940s. And they all they pulled all this out. And, and inevitably, when we would go to visit a family, uh, you know, we'd make an appointment uh, and we'd sit down and you know have tea or coffee or Coca Cola. And they'd get on the phone immediately and start calling their relatives. And, they'd, and, they, and all the relatives would then come. And they'd, you know, they'd say, the professors are here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, and so, so much of the stories do come. Uh, but you know, as one could imagine, the truth is slippery here. Um, uh, I, I can't remember who it was this, earlier this morning who said that the that the archive is corrupt. I, uh, Mon where's my Mon Monica? Yeah, that the that the arch that the materials in the government archives are, are are corrupt and unreliable for all the reasons that we know, and the family's memories are full of holes. And so, but from that, you have to begin to patch together something about, and from the accumulated stories, you begin to patch together something about what the period looked like and what it was that uh, people endured during this time. I'm also just wondering how much um, of that willingness to include the entire family um, was accompanied by some trepidation. I mean, I was so moved by the stories that were told today. Um, but I also heard lots of mention of trauma. And one thinks, or I think the psychological definition or psychoanalytic definition of trauma is a wound that hits so deeply that it bypasses the language centers of the brain and it becomes evidenced through other means, almost gestured or um, in, in, in withholdings. And I'm just wondering if you had to negotiate that kind of hesitation, not denial so much, but hesitation about how to reach well, those who were traumatized. If I, if I may, Melissa, yeah. let, let, me, let me just, let me, this is a story that is uh, close to my skin, and I've told it before. Uh, we, one of our students uh, was assigned to investigate the killing of Edwin Williams, uh, and you've heard uh, from his granddaughter about how he died uh, in Algiers, um, uh, uh, in uh, 19, 1942, 1942, 1943, and, um, and her, uh, so Erin tried to find a Williams, first of all, she's doing her genealogy and, you know, bothering Noah and trying to find a Williams, a black man named Williams in, in, in New Orleans. And of course, uh, ultimately, you know, after many, many hours on Ancestry, uh, a light bulb goes off and she says, there's a Williams at that same church where the incident took place. Could that person be related? And she calls uh, Jonique's father and she tells him that she wants to partner or she wants to talk to him about this. And his breath is taken away. He cannot talk about it. And that evening, um, he took a long walk with his wife because he was reliving. Uh, the, these, mem these memories were returning. And uh, at one point, he said to Aaron, has anything like this ever happened in your family? And Aaron, who's you know, Irish Canadian came down here to go to law school, had to say no. And she thought that was the end of the conversation. And I said to her, Erin, you have to press on. You have to go down to the next generation. And if there's to be a conversation with the Williams family, it will come from that next generation. And that's how she reached out and she found the brothers of Jonique, and ultimately, of course, it always falls on a woman to actually organize her family. <laughs> so, uh, so, I'm sorry, that's just that's the truth. Sorry about that. So, Jonique took this on. And she, she will probably tell you better than I, had to have long conversations with her father and her uncle 
to reconcile them to the idea that it, this was not theirs to hide, that it was part of our whole story, and, and that they had a responsibility as people who had lived through this to share the, the, it with their own kin. And so that's, you know, that's one side. And then, of course, um, Evan has told us about his own experience, which is he grew up living with the story. So both things have been true. We've found, found family members for whom this is deeply, uh, a deeply, as, as Hank has said, a deeply buried truth. And others for whom uh, it has been a living truth that they've carried with them uh, across the generations. One thing that sticks out to me thinking about many of the families that I've had the opportunity to meet is the generation below the person who was um, killed. Um, that uh, the nieces and nephews of those who had connections to the victim's siblings and how the family behaviors of their parents that they didn't understand, they better understand. And they didn't, and for certain it wasn't that they didn't, they didn't quite know, they knew there was something that was driving their parents' behavior. They were protective, or they were distrustful, or they were, there was something, and they weren't sure. And especially in those cases when the families knew very little, at least about the official story, they had their own understandings, and some of those understandings were uh, not full, and therefore didn't tell the whole story. So we're coming with this new information, and it's filling out a story. And, and then there'd be think, then you can see, I remember sitting in one kitchen in Atlanta, the, the bar of date, bar of The bar of And all of them sitting around, they all just started going, like almost at the same time, like, that explains, and they began to tick through. Now whether those things, you know, memory, as Margaret said, is quite complicated and all of those things, but you can see people at the time processing new information. Like we gave them another pair of glasses, and they were looking back and going, oh, Maybe that explains it. At least it gives you another frame to understand your, your experience, gives you greater empathy for your in-laws, because you're like, oh, that's what they were living through. So it, it brings another, just brings another texture and depth to you know, people's experiences. And that, if, at least I know for me, and I'm sure for Margaret, was so, and for the students, it's so deeply satisfying about that. I mean, it, at that point, you're as learning, as, you were all learning, and you're in the, you know, it's a, it's a lot. And I'm wondering, not so much about this archive as it's defined or bounded, but this is an archive of family in the most twisted and unbounded sense. In the sen I, I was thinking of the story of the, of, of, uh, of you know, the people who come to dinner. You know, we grew up together, and these are the white people who actually killed. Mm. And, you know, in some ways they may be related, as in Puddinhead Wilson. I mean, that the South is a deeply entangled family story that disguised its family by language of, of mm. the commerce of master and owner and ownership. And I, I am wondering if, you know, my mother's cousin was perhaps one of those reporters for the Pittsburgh Courier. She wrote a column for the Pittsburgh Courier. And one of the things I inherited were all these photographs that she was collecting, and she's not the only one, of the children who were called out on the days of lynchings and the pictures of children smiling. I mean, there are tons of white school children standing at the foot of various lynchings who were smiling. Mm -hmm. And I keep wondering what happened to them. Is there any parallel archive or family history of the people who did this? I know there are stories of, you know, you know slaves in the attic and so forth, but actually of the trauma that these children and what those grimaces, <laughs> those, you know, that Richter kind of smile um, of those children that one sees in the accomplishment of great cruelty, um, how those family stories are entangled as a parallel kind of archive and memory or erasure. Well, uh, Hank began to tell us a little bit about that uh, in his. Um, in his uh, presentation today when he related a conversation that he had with uh, the son of a uh, police officer who had participated in, in one of these vile acts and how, again, this goes back to Melissa's point, you know, you see 
the brain churning around <laughs> and new, new, new perceptions and a new narrative sort of trying to emerge out of this fog. And um, so that work is being done. It's not our work, uh, but it certainly is a, a parallel uh, perhaps to, to our work. And, you know, our hope for this archive um, is that it will generate uh, efforts, uh, more robust efforts at recovery at all levels, uh, you know, not just within the African American community, not just within those communities that have been victimized by this, but uh, racially victimized by this, but as well um, by white communities, which um, uh, which have their own story, certainly have their own story to tell. I can't go to uh, the Sun. I mean, this is something we tell our students. You know, you got to be able to talk to everybody. But the real deal is, I couldn't go to that Sun the way Hank uh, went to uh, him uh, and get that uh, from him. So, you know, that, that's just a cultural reality um, that we have to work uh, within. And so a lot of that work uh, has got to be done by the white folk who live in those areas. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, one of the values and one of the things that I think we all talk, thought about and which motivated this, Margaret described me and the students, of course, is that, you know, there is the act, the victim, the horror of the killing. But then there is the person and their family. And what we're trying to do is tell that part of the story. Where, yes, there was obviously is horrible crimes, but we also want to have some notion of the person before that happened, right? They weren't only that. They were this life. And that's what we're as much trying to capture and celebrate and give back to families and such. And paint a picture of Jim Crow that includes not just how it ended for too many of our people, but the lives that they lived under it, both it's to the degree that we can capture that through family stories and stuff, the wholeness and the goodness of people's experiences, as limited as they were by Jim Crow. In much the same way as, you know, um, so it's a kind of poetic part in that. As, so Margaret said, we can't do that for perpetrators, but it is their responsibility. I mean, this, you know, they were participants in this thing, right? We happen to be telling one part of the story finally, one that puts our, the experience of victims at its center and motivates it, and then looking at who perpetrated against them. Of course, that brings in the perpetrators who are the police, when appropriate, or private citizens. But we want to start there, much the same way, you know, when Morrison says in uh, Beloved, you know, the point of that book was to take you know, as she says, slavery's too glamorized. I'm taking it off of its pedestal and looking at the experience and telling it from the bottom up. We kind of want to, you know, do the same. Put it, yes, it's about Jim Crow, but we want to put it on its, on its victims and on, and on their families. Um, there was a book by an historian named Beth Roy called, I think it was, but it was about the children who um, an act of the violence at, um, who, um, at, at in, in Little Rock against their classmates and sort of followed them to grow up and how they became sort of the backlash of the moral <laughs> majority movement. And um, it's intriguing to me to, to sort of wonder backwards from yes. the archive that you have done um, about what the backlash against archival research, library research, where we began this morning, um, the, the, you know, the, the evacuating of Toni Morrison's stories based yes. on real legal cases. Right, exactly. Um, that what, you know, what is, what is between the lines? What's, 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 you know, what is motivating this? What makes this um, sudden book banning so seductive other than this history? And I, and I wonder if, if any of your archive really draws a through line between mm. some of the families in denial, mm. like that police officer's son, and the kind of denialism that has suddenly become so captivating for so many people, I mean, com completely captivating of our political discourse right now. Take that first, though. So, uh, <clears throat> so here I would point to the work of uh, 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 David Cunningham, uh, who a professor at WashU, who's part of this conference, uh, he and his colleagues are l looking at the, the, the mechanisms by which uh, these um, modes of behavior and, um, and uh, cultural uh, practices get uh, 
uh, transform down the line, how they, what, what, how they, how they become uh, legacies. Uh, and, you know, we all know that they do, um, and that uh, our relationships today uh, in our various communities and the differences between uh, Mississippi and Massachusetts are all related um, to these historical, I, I, I beg your pardon there, <laughs> historical events. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but how it happens, uh, you know, it, is really not well understood. Uh, and of course, if we knew how it happened, we knew all there was to know about how it happens, uh, then we would be perhaps better be able to identify um, intervening and disrupting uh, processes. Um, but aside from the fact that the U.S., as Melissa points out, unlike uh, many other countries in the world, has not had a, a, re a true reckoning, has not had a formal truth commissioning or anything of that sort. Um, but, you know, we don't, we, we just, you know, that I think is the next level or a next level of interrogation for scholars is to, uh, as Melissa says, once the data is collected and we now have, thank you everyone who participated in this, collected a significant amount of data and that will continue. Uh, but then once that happens, then we have to figure out, okay, what, what, what precisely, what is the relationship between a county, a heavy, Jim Crow violence county in 1944 in Georgia and a, a reactionary, in every sense of the word, county, same county in Georgia in 2022. We need that, that, that I think is yet to be excavated and that requires skills beyond those that I have as a lawyer. I mean, that requires the skills of, you know, you know anthropologists and sociologists and maybe political scientists, but you know, other disciplines have to bring uh, their toolbox to that challenge of figuring out uh, how these legacies um, are maintained and uh, reprised and, and recreated. I would say, um, in adding to that, uh, Pat, that you know, the backlash against what we're seeing now about kind of rethinking American history somewhat feels a bit, many, I mean, many societies obviously go through it and they go through it nearly every generation, right, of kind of the rewriting of the national narrative. And each time, but what's at stake in that is uh, kind of who, as we kind of know, you know, who has power to shape who we are? What is the story that we're going to tell? And the more complicated the story gets, the more decentered it gets, the more you have different voices who are attempting to provide another view. It's threatening for those who have had the privilege of basically writing the story, right? It's like might makes right. But if you begin to think that maybe there are other ways of thinking of, if, if, if that power gets challenged, right, in, in the sense of, well, there are another story, so we're gonna rethink, the, we're going to challenge the way you've told the nation's history. Um, of course you'd be threatened by it if, you, if, if you've won the story that's been told. If your story has been the story where you're the winner, you're not too interested in hearing from the losers or for those who may, may cast another light on the nature of your win. And so nearly all countries that have gone through really bad conflicts, they either have to make a decision about who we're gonna be after this war, right? The US, we came up with something after the Civil War, which is basically, we white people are gonna to get together and you all, we'll build it on your backs, Negroes. So it wasn't really until, as we know, the Civil Rights Movement and such that we began to think about a multiracial democracy in the US that makes sense. And we've had, what, 50 years, 60 years about it, and now I think a lot of white people are like, we're done with that, right? I mean, <laughs> did, we th did we say we wanted a real democracy? Maybe not. So I, so I do think that, that part of this has to do with the, nar the challenges to American narrative and American history are also deeply tied to what's happening with our notions of who will run the country, to democracy itself. Since much, much of our narrative has been, a you know, we are a democracy, an aspirational democracy, becoming one, whatever. But as that becomes to get closer and closer to being instantiated by the notion that people are going to demand the, their rights and have a narrative to support it, the challenges to the narrative come as the challenges to the votes come. That's what I think is behind. And so we're contributing because it's almost like we're in parallel universes. We've got like, you know, these people talking about, you know, banning Toni Morris and this and the other, and then the world is moving on. We're getting more complex, more multicultural, more interdependent at the very time that we've got, 
you know, a really kind of deeply nativist push. And I think those things make total sense going together because we are in a struggle for how, what is the 21st century going to look like? In the US, we're making, we're on the verge of making a lot of, I think, important decisions without sounding too apocalyptic. But it's not too difficult to think there are certain, there's certain junctures in American history, and we're in one of them. I'm really kept uh, also, I, I had a couple of graduate students some years ago, one from Chile and one from Argentina, and uh, they talked a lot about the silences and the gaps and really bringing particular kinds of experts to read those silences, mm. almost like Japanese mm. no theater, to actually see what was ringed by the absences. Mm. And um, I, I think some of this may go into things like affect theory about how you read you know, other signals that are not necessarily in papers or in language, um, or how you read the hesitations of people. Mm -hmm. But um, I am really wondering um, if there is um, some aspect of your research that has confronted this in the sense of things that you've decided not to include in the archive, mm -hmm. um, things that you've, I mean, is it simply that you take everything that you get, or have there, been, have there been decisions to leave this out for some reason? And what are the metrics of that? So, so that's interesting, Pat. So I mean, there were certain decisions that we made regarding just scope, you know, states, times. Uh, if, depending on who, the nature of the crime, not all crimes, uh, well, the deaths that were included, um, there was a, a evident uh, evidence of, of uh, racial animus. Right. So you can imagine there would be certain interactions between blacks and whites. You couldn't necessarily say were race, racially motivated in the way that others would be. Now, mind you, that's a tricky thing, thinking about the Jim Crow South, right? Because if the envelope is uh, racial subordination, right? So you would, but nonetheless, you can imagine the two people involved with perhaps an illegal activity where it's about money. It's about something where you could reasonably say it's not that. But mo mo the cases that we chose, there was, it had to meet that threshold. And we had certain uh, revelations of evidence in the documents which would reveal that. We were very careful about that. Um, uh, so those, that, the, those were certain of, certain of them, not all. Um, but what you're describing is something I think a little bit different, which is um, the silences. I mean, we wouldn't leave anything. What I he heard you saying, I, it took me more back to Pat, like talking to families or such, where you would imagine that you may not say, you know, you, there may be silences on both sides. There may be something that we knew in the record that perhaps we wouldn't want to share, would be too hurtful, or maybe there would be things that a family wouldn't want us to know because it's private. I mean, that, that goes on all, you know, all the time. And we'd have to, you know, Margaret would have more, and the students I'm sure had more experience with. And when you're in the moment talking with people, you do have to use you know, your judgment and your some sense of, humans, of human nature to know what is, what's, what's the line to, you know, to, to, uh, I, I, to draw? I, let me add here, so, uh, so you just, come just in, based Margaret. on. You know, what gave me a little bit of unease today was uh, uh, Tsioni's uh, presentation, uh, she, the uh, director of the um, uh, Restorative History Project at the Smithsonian, who talked about the ways in which they uh, engage with communities uh, in order to counteract the colonial, um, ac acquisitive colonial histories of archives and museums. And, um, and I thought about it, you know, I, it got me to thinking that, you know, our archive is going to be open to some criticism because we met with lots of families, but we didn't meet with a thousand families. And so people are going to find their families in our archive, uh, inevitably. Uh, and we're sharing material that we got from the public records, so certainly they could file a FOIA and find out themselves what the FBI and the DOJ were saying. But now we've made this readily available to the American public and to them. 
Right. And so there are going to be, there is going to be some sense that, you know, who, get, who, who okay. said you could share my story? And, uh, but, you know, but as I thought through that, I, you know, I thought, I thought it, the other side of that essentially is um, we, it's not possible to get the material that we need to make the transformational, both theoretical and practical and on the ground shifts that we need to, be, to make in our thinking about this period without collecting the data. And it's not possible to meet with a thousand families. It just is not the, 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 the kind of modalities that she was describing, which really resonated with me. It just seems so impractical. And so maybe that's just a, a natural collision between uh, our, our job, our function, as, you know, as um, Monica describes it, as recovering the data and our job as, re as uh, ensuring that um, the families are uh, fully uh, apprised, included, and not just included, but partnered uh, with us on the archive. Yeah, I, I, I really was asking about the sense of the ethics of the boundary of this archive, which I absolutely think is about removing from merely the domestic into the public sphere where these public trials that should have happened should have been. Um, so it returns it to the public. I don't, I, you know, I, I, but I think that the ethical line at this point in time probably is vexed yeah. when it comes to the sense of families who've lived with it as family information rather than something which, which you know, lives in the subjunctive of the trial that should have been. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's certainly tricky. I, I, I agree with that, as, as Margaret described it, yeah. Um, I'm curious about how your own families deal with, I mean, has this provoked reflection on your own family histories and relation to um, the documentation and archive of your own trajectories as scholars, as historians, um, as collectors, as storytellers? Um, you go first. No. Um, so, yeah, we start talking about fans, we get shy, right? Um, so, uh, no, my, uh, my father uh, was raised in Tennessee, and um, he, uh, when I started talking to him about this, uh, then he, he didn't tell me much about his childhood when I was growing up, um, other than you kids have it different than I have. Okay, damn. But then I just began, and luckily we didn't face violence. We lived in, he lived in, grew up in a small town, Fayetteville, Tennessee, between Chattanooga and Nashville. And, um, but he did talk about, he worked in a, a couple of things, you know, he said, you know, I was so glad to go over to Europe after he went after the wars, Germany served some years. And he talked about going to a restaurant in Alabama. And anyway, he was with a, another guy, a black guy. And he said, that guy, he walked into the restaurant in the front, Door. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and I said, really, Dad? He said, yeah. I said, why? He said, I thought we would have been lynched. I, you know, I'm from, I said, I, you know, I worked at a shop and, uh, you know, I was a, used to change tires. And he said, they, he called me nigger every day like it was my name. He said, you know, that's how it was. So he moved up to New York and then, I, anyway, we went back. He's, we went back to our family home down there. And um, he wouldn't walk around the town. He would, the places where he, that were integrated, he didn't believe it. This is my father. I was like, Dad, it's integrated. He was like, I'm not going in there. <laughs> this is like Barack Obama time. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going in there. So my grandmother grew up in South Carolina, a wholly different story. She, you know, she was like, that's why I had to get out of there. She said, I knew I had to get out of Union, South Carolina. And the first thing she wanted to do was come north. But those, so my family has been flight, fear, and flight. And that's certainly the experience. Luckily, no violence. But um, but fear and violence, but fear and flight. I I grew up with a father who grew up in Georgia, and I remember we visited Georgia, and I had never seen my father sweat before mm -hmm. and tremble. And in driving down, we stopped at a Howard Johnson, and he made us stay in the car, and uh, he couldn't believe that integration had come, and I I I I just saw the physical transformation. 
um, that he went through. Um, and a lot of my family came to Boston because of Ida B. Wells, you know, sort of all five of my grandmother's sisters you know, got out of Tennessee. They were also from Tennessee, got out of Tennessee at the first opportunity. Um, um, but there is... Um, so uh, yeah. one of the th uh, one of the I was asking Melissa a little earlier on what we wanted to convey here uh, as we close out this conference, and uh, so let me ask her a question, which is, you know, what do we hope for the future of this archive? <laughs> uh, Chancellor Nobles, uh, oh, go what ahead. Do you, <laughs> what, do you, what are your hopes for the future? Now that now that this now that V1, as as Gina has put it, V1 is done. It is. Uh, that it where is. Are we go? Where are we where are we going from here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, what I think is, this is what I hope for it. Um, whatever ways that we can improve V1, we do. And we get to version two. But I also hope, and I was unable to attend the, uh, the meeting yesterday of the Red Record, where others are working on this. I hope we have a lot of other of these kind of projects. I hope it spurs master's thesis. There's a county, there are community colleges in every southern county with history students who need a thesis. Because you know there's some bad theses out there, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so we all know. So if somebody can start getting their students to write these theses, right? make a whole lot of CCRJs. Let have mini ones, baby ones, whatever they need to be. But this is just as this has been such a collaborative process, it can continue to be so. And it seems to me if we can do that uh, and then inspire all of the other things that it can do, right? I mean, there's, there's no limits to human creativity and I'm sure people being inspired can do those things responsibly. We, I think we've set a rec, uh, hope we set a standard that we'll continue to refine of what is done when it's done responsibly, you know, with sensitivity, with rigor, with compassion, all of those things. If we are able to model that and others do it, that would be terrific. So that's what I would, that's what I would hope for, and even more, the more digital we get in the world, the more we're gonna allow for that kind of stuff. And as we become more digital, we also have to become more discerning in how we think about digital stuff, because of course, digital is great, but it can also be manipulated in kinds of ways. So as we do, we also have to remain, you know, ask discerning and critically thinking. Um, so that's what I hope for the archive. And I'm also really struck by how much of archiving and librarianship right now is threatened by issues of money um, or major don or dependent upon major donors. Exactly. So here is an opportunity to tell us how we can contribute um, to CRRJ and how um, where to contribute. But just also the, the sort of financial planning of an undertaking like this and the financial stability over time as part of that future. You can tell that story. How to contribute? Well, so Deborah Jackson is here. She has her collection box. So. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a lot about church today, so let's go to church. Put your dolls in her collection box. <laughs> no, institutional support. <laughs> institutional. Right. Well, big one is no, institutional institu support. Inst absolutely. I'm sorry. Institutional support. So, uh, you know, we were when we first started this thing. Um, Melissa and I, as as Deborah has said, and as many people have said. We relied <clears throat> very much on um, student labor, uh, but we also were able to hire a trained historian uh, in the wonderful um, Jay uh, Driscoll, who was hired by um, MIT early on in our year. So we knew we couldn't get down to Washington to get these documents. Um, and so we got this absolutely fabulous um, historian, Dr. Driscoll, who's here, um, who, and MIT picked him up and then you know, bit by bit, we got our institutions to buy into the project and um, and support it and get us to this point. Uh, and uh, I, I, I will always be grateful uh, to our library for realizing at some point we had something here, you know. Uh, we had something that could actually um, go out into the world as an archive and um, and do what we hope uh, hope it will do. So... Yes, institutional support, uh, and mo more and more institutional support was, was really critical. Yeah. And foundations. Yeah. And we, foundations. We thank the Mellon Foundation, the Carnegie Ford. Foundation, the, the Ford, Ford Foundation, Foundation, and 
folks know other, pa other places <laughs> where we can go, we're happy to hear about it. I think we're done. Is this, is this the signal? <laughs> <laughs> we're done. Yeah, no, th uh, again, I, I just want to thank you both for, and, and everybody of, uh, involved with this. I'm particularly just moved because I think I came into this room as you know, a professor on this faculty, but I come out with a new mandate to really reassess how I do teaching um, and how the experience that you've brought forth in this archive um, is something that needs to be incorporated in all of our educational mission, every single bit of it from top to bottom. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful to what you've brought to the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.